Thai, but I caught two English words, bonus piece. Uh, so yes, this is completely ad hoc. I don't have a presentation, no slides, uh, but I scribbled some stuff on a piece of paper uh, because I sense that I gave you a bit of an appetizer, but you were hungry for the main course after my opening um, presentation this morning. So basically, I just want to put everything into perspective. You've heard from individual companies, you know what's going on with the market, but what about sector strategy and how do I see it? Um, so I put the investment strategy that I see as being optimal into five buckets, right? Five categories. Firstly, I think the business cycle in Vietnam is not over yet, right? Globally, you're seeing increasing signs that the business cycle, the credit cycle is maturing. But I think Vietnam is a bit of an exception to the rule. Vietnam is not immune to the maturing of the credit cycle globally, but there's very strong economic momentum. Therefore, don't run away from banks yet, because I know there was a sharp correction in banking stocks, but credit growth this year is still going to be at least 16%. Net interest margins are expanding for a lot of banks as they reorient their portfolio to retail and SME lending. So number one, don't play banks broadly like you could have done in 2017 and made a lot of money, but play it selectively. Look at banks like LPB, as I mentioned before, and MBB, Military Bank, which have solid underlying stories, are undervalued relative to peers, right? Property is a little bit more tricky because there are segments of the property cycle that are maturing. The high-end segment in particular has seen a huge amount of supply uh, in, in past years, and so there is some yield compression in that segment. However, you could look at segments of the property market where supply is hugely below demand, and one example of that is landed properties. I don't know what the cultural dynamic in Thailand exactly is, but Vietnam, a little bit like China, they like their property to be on the ground. People don't really like the idea of owning an apartment in a large condominium, right? So villas, townhouses, and to some extent shop houses as well are, in, are still in huge demand. And if you talk to CBRE and Savills in Vietnam, for instance, and potentially our friends at, uh, at Senland as well, they'll tell you that total demand for those kinds of landed properties is way, way, way in excess of, of supply. So for example, Kandien is KDH is, is a company that's poised to win in that segment. The, another reason is that that segment is not as prone to interest rate rises because mortgages are not the driver of purchases in that market. So property, I'd be selective, but there are pockets of the property market that offer value. The second big category after cyclicals is exports. I mean, Thailand is obviously not a stranger to exports, and everybody focuses on the Vietnam domestic demand story, and that's absolutely correct. But let's not forget that Vietnam is in the middle of a long-term structural trend where it's taking over as the export hub of Southeast Asia. And this is driven not just by Vietnam's own competitiveness, it's the fact that China is transitioning away from an export-led model to domestic consumption-led model. And there's one country, if there's one country that's really poised to benefit from that, it's Vietnam because of its geographical location, labor cost advantages, long coastline, etc. Within exports, I would say there are two categories that I think are interesting. One is textiles. That doesn't sound very interesting, prima facie, but I'll tell you why. A couple of years ago, TPP was supposed to be a game changer for Vietnam, right? But TPP imposed rules of origin. So if you had the yarn not made in the TPP block, coming from China, for instance, Vietnamese garment exports would not qualify for the TPP import tax exemptions. What that did was it triggered a massive amount of upstream and midstream investment in the textile sector. So even though TPP didn't happen, it catalyzed 
the development of an integrated textile value chain in Vietnam. As a result of that, Vietnam today has a massive competitive advantage versus competitors like, for example, Bangladesh, Cambodia, et cetera, in textile exports. And you're already seeing that the order books of Vietnamese textile producers are actually showing real signs of strength. So the two names I have here which are interesting is TCM, which is a sort of integrated uh, and one of the largest garment producers in Vietnam. And the second one is actually a upstream player called Century Fibers, STK. They make polyester yarn. Both these companies are seeing a big recovery in their earnings after their stock prices got hammered last year. So this is an opportunistic story. The second sector which is very interesting is fish or seafood exports. And um, within fish, you know, Vietnam is very famous for pangaceus, basically. It's a local type of, of catfish. Pangaceus has been a very successful export category for Vietnam over several years, but there were a lot of problems because there was, you know, the US was the biggest destination of Vietnamese panga exports, but the US has a very, very strong catfish farming lobby and they were lobbying the government to impose import duties. So there was a lot of negative publicity also in Europe, in the EU, around the fact that Vietnamese pangaceus, what they call basa, is essentially infected with antibiotics, etc. This was all motivated to kill the industry, but it was basically protectionism. Now, some companies were smart enough, and there's a company called IDI, what they did is they said, forget the US, especially after Mr. Donald Trump came to power, they said, well, there's no hope there, right? So they started opening up new markets and China has emerged as a major consumer of Vietnamese panga exports. China is obviously still a developing country. It's seeing huge increase in per capita protein consumption, but not everybody can go and order Nova Scotia salmon and you know, expensive seafood or types of protein. So white fish is actually a cheaper and affordable form of fish-based protein. And therefore, I think that China is going to continue to be a big consumer of Vietnamese panga exports. So look at IDI. It's a slightly speculative, high beta stock, but very strong fundamentals. The yield that they get per kilogram of pangasius is very high. It's about three and a half to four dollars because they make fish oil, they make fish meal, fish feed, and pangasius fillets. So um, that's a very interesting name to look at and trading at a big discount appears. The third story I want to talk about after exports is actually power. And a lot of people say, well, why should I look at a company like PV Power? It's a, it's a utilities company, it doesn't, hasn't paid a dividend in, in, in years, why would I bother looking at them? The reality is because you cannot look at Vietnamese utilities companies like you look at utilities companies in more mature economies. Because a utility company in Vietnam is not just another boring dividend play. Power consumption in Vietnam is growing at 10 to 12% per year, double GDP growth. So when you put that into perspective, you recognize that there is huge volume growth. Also, Vietnam has among the lowest power retail prices in, in Asia. It's only seven to eight US dollar cents per, uh, per kilowatt hour. The government has no choice but to increase that over time, which means there's a liberalization of the power sector underway and prices are gonna rise. Within this sector, however, I don't like generation companies so much. Because generation companies obviously are exposed to commodity prices. Tomorrow, if gas prices rise, a company like NT2, which is gas-based, becomes less competitive, right? Same with coal. If the weather is amazingly favorable to hydropower producers in one year, remember that 40% of Vietnam's electricity uh, installation, installed capacity is still hydropower, then hydro takes share from thermal-based power plants. So there's a lot of commodity price risk but there's one company I want to highlight. It's called PC1. PC1 is the leading power engineering and equipment manufacturer. So they build substations, transmission lines, etc. They have a very good relationship with EVN, Electricity Vietnam. So they're often a favored contractor. The Vietnamese government has earmarked several billions of dollars in expansion of the transmission grid. And PC1 is very well poised to win those contracts.
Uh, in fact, this year, we expect their order book will actually see pretty healthy growth. So, so watch out for PC1. PV power is interesting, and it's the only power generation company I would recommend because there's a natural hedge. It's got coal, it's got gas, and it's got hydro. So even if the relative competitiveness of these different sources in the energy mix changes, PV power will not lose out because it's got a presence in all of those. The fourth category that I think is interesting is agriculture and livestock. Vietnam is very much still, you know, I wouldn't say an agricultural economy, but the, the, the majority of the population is employed in agri. And Vietnam has been very successful in select categories of the agri market. Cashew, rubber, rice, you name it. Vietnam is actually punching way above its weight for, for its size. But within the agri sector, the one name that I think is interesting is a company called DBC, Dabaco. And this is one of the leading pig value chain companies. It's like a very, very tiny CP focused on the pig segment. And these guys are gonna benefit massively from a cyclical recovery in pork prices, which is already starting to kick in. So take a look at DBC. They also have an integrated value chain from pig rearing to pig feed, uh, all the way they're gonna go downstream into processed meat. Uh, and that's a very interesting name. And the final name that I'm gonna give you, or the final sector in my list of five is actually, well, I'm gonna lump these two together actually, automotive and also aviation. And why, why am I lumping these two together? For one very simple reason. These are long-term structural growth stories in Vietnam. If you look at automotive uh, penetration in Vietnam, and you look at aviation and pen penetration in Vietnam, both make Vietnam appear at the bottom of the list in ASEAN. RPKs per capita and cars owned per capita, some of the lowest in Asia and the lowest in ASEAN. So maybe Laos is lower, but then again. So the reality is both of these sectors are gonna see long-term structural growth. Even though people say ACV is expensive, Combine the fact that they raised domestic passenger handling fees last year by 33%. This year, they're gonna raise it by 25%. And passenger volumes through Vietnamese airports are gonna grow at at least 15 or 20% per annum. You can see easily why the valuation multiple for a monopoly operator like ACV is justified. The other one I really like is automotive. But automotive is not just about a structural growth story. It's also an opportunistic play. As you know, the ASEAN Free Trade Agreement came into force, right? And this year, import taxes on completely built units of cars into Vietnam actually fell to 0%. Well, the Vietnamese consumers were expecting that. So last year, you had a complete stagnation, actually a fall in automotive volumes. Why? Because buyers per postponed their purchases to this year in anticipation of price declines. Now you're starting to see dealer prices just about begin to drop. That means that there's gonna be a strong resumption in purchases. All that postponed latent pent up demand for automobiles is ultimately gonna be realized. So start looking at dealerships, and there are some dealerships like Sovico, SVC, et cetera, which have a broad portfolio of brands in the mass market segment, which is where the real growth is. So that's all I have. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you.